Welcome to Let's Play D&D with Ran Yakumo with our special guest or DM Kagera. That would be me. Hello. <laughs> so this is just the introduction because we will be playing in this custom world, as you can see, quite large. Um, and I wanted to make an introduction to explain about the various places and races that this world has. As well as obviously the actual characters that will be participating. Anyway, beginning here the western continent, land of the Morlocks, the Gnomes, the Halflings and a few hu humans. Is where... Well, where m we started. Um, we were going in the direction of this continent towards the eternal forest but that well you will see later the point is the main continent this massive big piece of land <laughs> yes that one <laughs> <laughs> is home to most of the races except like the ones in the deep sea so we have the Minotaurs, yes, that's a playable race. <laughs> well, more gnomes and humans and halflings. There's the Fuato, who are... Who are the Fuato? The centaurs, I think? They are the giant elephant people. Oh yeah, those ones. Were those actually playable? <laughs> yeah, um, mm. the cleric was going to be a Fuato. Nice. There's the Flintlings. Which are stone people. The dwarves and the Ma ah right the Marashi were the they were hyena warriors that were proficient with bows, right, and had wings. Mm -hmm. And there's the centurions, which are basically living armors. If I remember correctly. Yep, that's right. And they were not an option as a playable race because they're ridiculously overpowered. I can imagine. There's the Norse, which are, well, Norse. <laughs> Within the Eternal Forest live the Elves and the Kitsunan, which was, you can take a guess at what I'm playing. <laughs> it's not that hard. It's pretty obvious, actually. Yeah. <laughs> then, further to this are the Tonarat, which is the eagle people, I believe? The Thorineth, yes. Those are the eagle people made by the god Bronn. Yes, the same one that made the Centurions. Color coded for your f easiness of understanding. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, who was the god with the Herpes and the Satyrs? That was uh, Paniotis. Right, Paniaptis, yeah. who was the god of freedom. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, there's nine gods, each with one alignment. So the Chao did good god, which is Paniaptis, created the Harpies, the Satyrs, and the Genie. I think all of them were playable. Yes, all, of, all three of those were playable, but nobody chose any of them. Yeah, oh well. Yeah, fun fun fact, the Thornith were brutally forced out of their own territory by the Harpies. Oh yeah, see that tiny yellow symbol on Harpy territory? Yeah. That was a Thornith city. And then it wasn't. Exactly. Uh, Raylin, the neutral good goddess of the forest, is the one over here that created the entire Eternal Forest and a few races to the bottom. Well, one race to the bottom, namely the Grey Elves. Buron was the Paladin God, quite literally. <laughs> and he created... He, he was a little bit over the top. Yeah, a bit. Not to mention he actually lived on the top of uh, one of the tallest mountains of the <laughs> world, but eh. Then there's the Lawful Neutral Wood, 
whose name was that was Caloam. Caloam, the god of stone. Which, if you look at the races, actually makes a lot of sense. All grouped in that one spot. Mm -hmm. The actually no, never mind. Panioptis was the a ver, no, wait. Raylan was the neutral, the neutral, neutral goddess. No, yeah, I'm, I forgot who. who uh, Sophia. Yeah, what alignment was she? She was true good, so uh, neutral good. Ah, right, Raylan was true neutral, right? Yes. Right, so Sophia was neutral good. And she was the god of, goddess of curiosity, pretty much. Yep, that, sounds, that about sums it up. She created the gnomes, the halflings, and... Oh, right, she created the sylph, right down here. They were fun. Yeah, they were fun. And then the chaotic neutral god, who was... Oh, right. That was the, the dweller in the darkness. Yes, the dweller. Also known as the god of as the god of fate, funnily enough, <laughs> who created the Nasu, aka Ratman, and the Takuma, which were a sub race of humans that got kind of expelled from their territory. And I don't think they even have a city anymore. Yeah, they basically became nomadic. Oh, and the orcs, of course. The orcs are weird in this universe. They had a tiny island, and that's it. And they're also uh, good aligned. Oh, right. For some reason. <laughs> yes, for some reason. So we go now to the deep one, the god of storms, who is also the lawful evil god, who created... Well, his first rise were the Fukasa, which are unplayable and abs absurdly por powerful living well below where anyone will actually go <laughs> yeah they are the third most ancient race in the game the second being the Kitsunen and oh. then the first is the, is the dragons which I made hi he's very proud of them <laughs> yeah no kidding anyway the deep one also created the murlocs Which kind of uh, made a pretty. D d um, they messed up the halflings quite badly, <laughs> in case you can yeah, tell. Yeah, they, uh, they, they kind of got a little bit nicer and gave some territory back afterwards, though. Yeah. A, a little bit. Oh, well. <laughs> they created the uh, Shinkai, which are like the deep ones, but not so deep. <laughs> That's basically the only way to describe them. <laughs> They're both fish people. Yeah. And they have created the dragon, we, but I'll go into that later. Uh, do I have to speak about this guy? I, I'll keep it as short as possible. I'll do it for you. Thank you. In the... The humans were created by the god Daur, who is the true evil god, and the player that played him really lived up to his name. He created the humans in the north, which are kind of assholes, and the Enko and the Seppu in the south, which are kind of assholes. Yes. And that's about all we're going to talk about those guys. Yeah, needless to say, that was the one point where the fourth wall was breaking at the point where everyone hated him. <laughs> yep. And that's why the humans uh, have so little territory. He also kind of s created them in a spot where they couldn't expand very well. Yeah, good point. Now, this massive piece of red area, along with this one, that's from Akiu, the god of trickery and games. The and also insanity and chaos. Of course. Oh, and the void. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, 
Aquí Uti the first one to create dragons. I used to be a rice boat then they became kinda long wolves and they all the dragons except the avatar cartus. Uh, well, most of the dragons just flew everyone in their own random direction living on their own. That was about a thousand years before the campaign starts. Pretty much. And instead the Dragonic Empire was replaced by the Kobolds. The massive, somewhat for orderly for some reason, Kobold Empire. <laughs> Very orderly for the God of Chaos. Yeah. To be fair, it was mostly, mostly fanatism that made them orderly, but oh well. <laughs> So, anyway, Aku created the massive volcano and dragon city over here, and then created the crystal forest and a heck ton of wonders inside it. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there. It's also total adventurer bait. Yeah, it's basically near needing epic levels of difficulty that place. I mean, it's a forest made out of gemstones and precious metal, so, yeah. And don't forget that the rivers are actually molten metals. <laughs> yep. Also so, yeah, yeah there is a lava. The basic equivalent of the river of death actually runs from the volcano towards that canyon. <laughs> without solidifying. Yes. Because magic. <laughs> because who doesn't need more magic? Of course. So anyway, up to there is where Cobalt Territory used to go until, until they started attacking the Ratman and the Takuma. Oh, and of course, Tienko. Yeah, that was the thing. Yeah, <laughs> Tienko and Sebu Territory came all the way over here. And then it didn't. Yep. This also was Harpy territory. <laughs> yeah, until the Cobalt decided they wanted to build a dragon port. <laughs> They're still building it. It's not done yet. Yeah, I know, but it's still funny. <laughs> the, fa the fact that they will use dragonic creators as planes. <laughs> I mean, who wouldn't want to fly on a dragon? Of course, who wouldn't? It's like the Olifants from Lord of the Rings are set with wings. <laughs> Pretty much. And there's the Draken, which were a mix between the Dragons and the Fukasa. Literally a joint effort between both gods to create a sort of masterpiece hybrid. Which actually worked pretty well. Surprisingly. Yeah. All right, that city was also Nasu territory. And then it wasn't. Exactly. That all that that city also used to be covered in uh, sex fog. <laughs> right. And then it wasn't because we decided that was a little bit too crazy. Yeah, it was kind of ridiculous. Yeah. It was technically made just to be a, an impediment to traverse the place, but still. And then the Dweller decided to use it to make a lot of Ratmen. A lot yes. of Ratmen. A lot of Ratmen. I think it was about a hundred years in that city with the sex fog. Something like that? Yeah, it was pretty nuts. Yeah. Um, I believe that's about it to... about... Oh well, there's quite a lot of wonders actually, for example, the Pillars of Balance. I almost yeah. forgot about them. <laughs> Those things are huge. Yeah, that's the actual size. Yes, it's and a giant black sphere that is orbited by four pillars of varying color. And that they are infused with the powers of law, chaos, good, and evil. Oh, and there's this little floating island next to it where an order of monks live, studying the pillars. Oh yeah. Um, Alright, the Grey Elves, I almost forgot. 
this little extra two cities that Raylene created. Which, by the way, Raylene was the good that Kagera played. Oh, hi! <laughs> anyway, they created these two cities, which, well, Grey Oils were basically else focus, f uh, focused on knowledge more than anything. And magic. Right, and magic. So they live right by the right by Neraten, which I believe was the Nasu capital of knowledge. Yes, with the Vault of Lore right Ex next to it. Exactly. So it was quite a nice alliance. It was a very nice alliance, and it was probably the entire reason I created the Grey Elves in the first place. Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, speaking of the massive Cobalt Empire, they love games. I believe about a third of the massive population is either a professional gamer or a game designer of some kind. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of ridiculous. Funny, but ridiculous. Yes. There's also a uh, there pretty was big alliance between the kobolds, the sylph, the grey elves, and the draken. Yeah. It was kind of massive. It was more. It was really more of a pact of non-aggression with the sylph and the rest, but either way. Yeah, because that army is scary. <laughs> yeah, the armies don't actually show here, but the I kobold. There were about three of them in the northernmost mo northernmost kobold city. There, there were like at least three of them in every city. <laughs> there were more, and there were much more to the west. Yes, I mean at least three of them in every city. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, so to detail the various races, well, I don't think we need to explain all of the races, but we should at least explain the races that are being played, I suppose. Yes, in the party we have a halfling, two Kitsunan, a. Uh, ugh, what is that guy again? I forget now. Who? Uh, Eric. Oh, Eric's Eric, a dwarf. That's right. Eric's a dwarf. And then my a stone link, I believe. A flint link. Yes. So, hey, the look! There's me! <laughs> yep, over there. And Whee! below them is a character from another game that I'm using for other stuff. Oh, right. And. Um, oh, yeah, there was a Morlock as well. Actually, played by the one who created them, the God of. Mo the God of the Sea. Yep, and there's there he is right there. Just moved him. Oh, hi, Strobes. For some reason, I don't have permission over my character. Oh well. Oh, uh, this is this is an older version of the map, so ah. not everything's set up correctly. Makes sense. So anyway. Um, my character, Ranjakumo, that <laughs> is a Kitsunan monk. Based, uh, the based after the actual Ranjakumo. Yes. So there's like a kind of funny story that is supposed to be before she actually met Yukari, for those that actually know. Um, and the story goes that she was kind of stuck in a in a cycle of basically re getting reincarnated and remembering her previous lives. So basically that's the excuse when I, when I also play other games with her. <laughs> it's a pretty good excuse to get her into just about everything. Yeah, it's like, oh, it's just another reincarnation. Yeah. Makes sense, works, whatever. <laughs> but the point is she hasn't met Yukari or Chen yet. And she's just living her life for a different reason. And, well, <laughs> was pr a pretty funny story that she, before the actual game began, she entered a. Uh, I believe it was against the. I it was think. The Minotaurs. Yes, it was in the Minotaur Lounge. She entered a. <laughs> a martial art contest and she won. <laughs> and. There were a lot of. Pain, really, really painful minotaurs after that. 
Yeah, basically the entire city tried to cover up everything because they were pride hurt. <laughs> because they got beaten up by a little fox girl. Yeah. A fox girl mastering the arts of the iron tail technique. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah. So, uh, a little bit more detail about the races that we are going to be using. Uh, I'm going to be doing some D&D &D terminology for those of you that are already familiar with it. Yes, uh, good But point. I'm not going to explain it into detail, because that would take too long. Yes, good idea. So, as I pull up the races page... Good point. As I pull up the correct races page... As I go to the as I go to the Google Docs because I can't find the actual races page. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna start from the left, go to the right, and just to make sure that none of the players decide to go anywhere, we're gonna put some bees around them. Ah uh, yes, the bees. There's always going to be bees. Don't ever forget that. Yes, because remember, you can't go that way. There are bees there. Not the bees. So, the murlocs, they're, the majority of their description is something to the, to the effect of Yes. For those of you that are D&D savvy, they are monstrous humanoids, and they are small characters. They move at a speed of 30 feet per 6 seconds, and they don't like other races very much. They're basically frog people. Yes. To the right of shrubs is Rosemary, the... The halfling rogue, I believe? Yes, she is a halfling rogue. For those of you that are already familiar with D&D, she's a halfling. It's the basic type of halfling. Yes. For those of you that aren't already familiar with D&D, halflings are like little humans. For those that have known Lord, Lord of the Rings, they're hobbits. <laughs> yes, or they're hobbits. Naoki, to the, to the right, is a... Kitsunon. Kitsunons are medium fey that live in the eternal forest. And they move at the speed of they move at a speed of 30 per 6 seconds. They have the ability to transform into any humanoid, which is kind of really overpowered. Yes. But it's still okay for some reason. Yes. Well, it must they be don't have any they don't have any other special abilities, but their true form is that of a normal looking fox. Mhm. Mm or in Rand's case, a normal-looking nine-tailed fox. Of course, it's it's not really that it's the sort of true fox, but most likely because she remembers all her all her, her previous life, she kinda kept it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Moving on. Yeah. Anyway. Moving on to Eric. Eric is a dwarf. For those of you familiar with D and D, dwarves are dwarves. He's. For those uh, of you familiar with Lord of the Rings. Dwarves are dwarves. They like stone. They do mining things. For those familiar with fantasy of any kind, dwarves are dwarves. Dwarves are dwarves no matter what universe you're in. And there's not much you can do to change that. Yep. Alright, and now he's an illusionist. Who is actually quite useless in most occasions, but that's alright. Even the illusionist can live. Sometimes. <laughs> Although yes. his snake might not be so lucky. I I think the illusionist was from Eric, wasn't she it? Oh no, never yeah, mind. Yeah, it's Naoki. Poor snake. Poor Hanai. Yeah, poor Hanai. Spoiler alert? <laughs> yes, all of the spoiler alerts. And moving on to the final character, we have Denma, the Flintling. Flintlings are basically humans that are made of stone and are immune to disease. And, like, I don't think they need to, like, eat or drink or anything or something like that. They're basically living golems. Yes, they're quite strong. Um, they're also small. Mm. For some reason. <laughs> yes. Uh, let's see. And he's a warrior, I believe. Yes, he is a uh, fighter. Yes, and he has an axe. Work. And I don't remember if this is set up in this version. It is not. And he loves to ask you a question. Yes, he also likes to be argumentative about things that make things more fun. Spoiler yes. alerts. He's a very lawful character. And yes. below them, we see this character from a different game that is an elf. And she's also very, very, very powerful. 
and not actually part of the game, but eh. But I enjoy using her to cast spells randomly anyway. Of course. Oh yes, and in the event that uh, the Fuato ever actually joins the game, oh. this is a Fuato. The Fuato are giant elephant people. They are large creatures. They move at 30 feet per round. They are very strong and very wise and not very dexterous, which kind of makes sense because they're basically elephants. Yes. And Moto is a uh, Fuato cleric with a good motto. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, no, that picture's not accurate at all. We just needed something to fit the character for a little bit. Yeah, makes sense. And thus we have an explanation of all the characters that have. Yep. That was, yep, and characters that will likely be met. Or I guess we'll go into races that'll likely be met. Mm. The gnomes are basically inventors. They're the same size as halflings, but yeah. they're smarter. Inventors, thinkers, you know. Yes. The humans are, well, you know, humans. humans. They're boring. And yes. they're not, for those of you familiar with D&D, &D, where humans are kind of the de facto race, if you don't know what it is, it's probably a human. Not true in this world. If you don't know what it is, it's probably not a human, in this case. Because most things aren't human, in case you can't nope. actually tell the very large amount of territory of, what, two cities they have on the wo whole world? Now they've got three, actually. they got one that's like on the edge of halfling territory. Oh, right. That's actually one of their cities still. Barely. They, uh, at one point, almost had the Minotaurs wiped out. And then the Minotaurs fought back. And yep. the humans started losing. Oh, right. That was when the Wolf, uh, when the wolf uh, first attacked, wasn't it? Yes. And other races that are likely going to be met? Uh... Well, Minotaurs. Minotaurs, eventually. Yeah. And also the Wood Elves in the Eternal Forest. Yeah, most likely. They're, they're basically just elves that live in the woods and yes. are very proficient with two swords at the same time. Yeah, that's kind of it. They're elves. <laughs> yes, they're elves. They like wine. It's just a thing. They like music. And what and else? To the north of the elves, the Norse, which may eventually be come across are humans that are somewhat hardier than normal humans they are also rather territorial but they don't tend to leave their territory either so you're not going to run into them very often yeah unless you're actually in Norse territory in which case you might get attacked outright by them so basically Norse are t like humans but stronger cooler and tougher <laughs> and not made by Alex exactly oh right and more frozen Yes, and more Frozen. Because e Frozen makes everything better. Of course! I'm not gonna start singing. I st I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I almost didn't see that coming. Anyway. So? Uh, so, speaking about a certain plot point I just randomly triggered, aka the Bull Fever. Yes. The main reason the story actually started, which is. Mm -hmm. Which I believe it was in Gemstone. The yes, it was in Gemstone, and I'm looking for the original plot point. I think I might have put it in here, actually. If I remember correctly, we all received a letter asking for help. Yes. Alright, I'm just going to go ahead and straight up read out the pilot that I gave you all. Good idea. Yes. So every player before the game started was given the same pilot. And then there was a little bit of RP, which will be probably linked below after it gets compiled together. So, the pilot was this. The carrier pigeon's note showed you where to go. You've all been to gemstone, gemstone before for varying periods of time. However, during this visit, there's a clear difference. Outside the city, there are fields of white tents. The city guards look worried and scared. They're handing out face covers to everyone who enters the city. The city itself is barren. Few people are on the streets, and all that are are wearing masks. The smell of sickness is in the air as you enter the tavern. Around the common room, you hear the same word over and over. Bull fever. 
And that was the pilot that I gave everybody. Uh, yep. So. And that'll also be linked below. Good one. So, yep, that's kind of the starting of the story. We basically got together in the Inside Tavern and the role-playing in character started. And after a while, the actual session started with, you know, here in Matul's. Yep. So, that's the introduction done. We will... Uh, well, w I'll wait for Kage to do the compilation and upload, and you will soon see the introduction and the... Well, you're already seeing the introduction, but you will see the first session soon. <laughs> anyway, that's it for today. Ranjakumu... Um, what do I say anyway? Just goodbye, I suppose? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as well as anything else. Yeah. Have a cute day. <laughs>